The first half of the movie, I was following along fairly well, and then the second half of the movie was like... <laughs> what? <laughs> Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. Konnichiwa, it's Kyle here and we've got something special for you this Kawaii Friday. You may be aware the final Evangelion film has landed on Amazon Prime, bringing with it a brand new dub with many of the original ADV cast reprising their roles. So how do the original voice actors feel about returning to these roles and redubbing the prior films with Amazon? Well, we thought we'd ask, and we got a response. But before we get stuck in, if you are new to the channel, consider hitting that subscribe button and giving us a thumbs up, there's plenty more video content on the way. Well, we got in touch with the original voice of Oscar, Tiffany Grant, and asked her to join us for a chat as we look back on a journey which has been over two decades in the making. Tiffany, thank you so much for joining us on Kawaii Fi. Yes, thank you. I'm now, thrilled to be here. The final Neon Genesis film is finally out worldwide, bringing us the close of a 26-year story that's been in the making. How are you feeling? Uh, it's a little surreal, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I went to see it uh, on Saturday, which was uh, the 14th. It was the day after it premiered on Amazon Prime. And I got to go and watch it in a movie theater in Los Angeles with uh, many of my fellow castmates. So that was pretty fun. You know, the anticipation of waiting for it, it's got pushed back and delayed for so many years. I mean, even before COVID, it just, it got pushed back so many times. It's kind of crazy that it's finally here. Yeah, now <laughs> without any spoilers, what did you think of the ending? <laughs> well, the first half of the movie, I was following along fairly well. And then the second half of the movie was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> so there was a lot of stuff going on. So what I'm doing now is um, I decided I'm going to rewatch the first three movies because I haven't watched them in a really long time. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to rewatch those and then I'm going to rewatch Thrice Upon a Time and see if it'll make just a little more sense to me. Yep, that, that's fair enough, and that, that's uh, very reminiscent of what we saw with the original series, where you, you got to the end and you went, wait, what did I watch again? <laughs> yeah, yes, I, I remember that quite well, but this was like that, but times ten, so... <laughs> so I mean, that's a, that's a thing with, with, with Anno and Evangelion, is that he wants to leave people guessing, and like, not any set answers, so make a guess. Well, with such a big story, I guess it does make sense to kind of leave that little bit of flexibility with it. Now, mm -hmm. Neon Genesis has become quite an incredibly influential anime over the years, both Japan yeah. and globally. When you first yeah. signed on to play Oscar back in the ADV days, did you ever uh -huh. imagine after 20 years you'd still be voicing her? Uh, no, I guess not really. Um, uh, yeah, you know, when we did the AVA TV series, that's all that existed was the TV series the dub that we were doing, the English dub, so it was the first dub in any other language apart from Japanese, and we also released it on home video first anywhere in the world. So the English language version came out on home video in the U.S. before the home video release came out in Japan. Oh, wow. So we were doing this very early on. So yeah, I, I would have had no way to imagine that there would be, you know, like Death and Rebirth and End of Ava and then the Rebuild films and, you know, on and on and then and who knows what next. But I, I certainly would never have imagined it being this sort of global iconic phenomenon that it is. And mm. what's crazy the last couple of days is like turning on, uh, you know, Amazon Prime, connecting to Amazon Prime, and then there's a the big banner advertising Ava, uh, you know, 3.0 plus 1.0 is right there. It's like, that's just weird. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing it advertised like that on, on my TV screen in my living room. It's just, wow. Hey, I'm in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> you, you guys did have that six-year gap when between the third film's dub and then coming in and then redubbing all four of the films for Amazon Prime. Right. Was it yeah. a bit strange to revisit the characters so soon? 
You know, I, I always feel like Asuka is really close to my heart all the time. She's not a character that I ever have to search for when I go in the studio. I don't ever need to say, oh, geez, can you play me a reference file? I can't remember what Asuka's mm. like. Uh, so Asuka's always with me. She's with me all the time. And, yeah, that there was a break there of, of several years between um, – when we dubbed uh, Ava uh, 3.33, also known as You Can Not Redo. Um, when we dubbed it for the second time in 2014, I think is when we recorded that. Um, yeah, so then that was, uh, yeah, about six and a half years until we were recording this. And see, another thing that people may not realize is the uh, the fourth movie we actually started recording on that in December. So people people think that like oh we only just did it a few weeks ago or something. No, we didn't. I had to keep that secret for a long time. Wow, yeah, <laughs> really hard. It was so hard when I told a friend of mine about it. He was like, "Wow, Tim, I can't believe you kept that. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing that you you kept that a secret for such a long time." I'm like. Yeah, I know. <laughs> now, you mentioned that Oscar is really important to you. Like, it's easy for mm -hmm. you to find her. I believe from mm -hmm. some interviews you've previously done, she's had an important role to you personally. What made her such a memorable and iconic character for you? She has such a journey, you know, such a difficult um, story arc that she goes through. When we're first introduced to Oscar, there's a lot of bluster on the surface where she kind of rubs people the wrong way and i totally get that particularly in the tv series and you don't really know that much about her or her backstory but then as you really get to delve into her background it's really quite a tragic story as all of these characters have such awful tragic backgrounds that they've dealt with and I think just, you know, getting to know her and sympathizing with the things that she's had to deal with and, you know, being sort of a misunderstood character. And I think all of us feel like that sometimes that, oh, they don't really understand me, you know, and that I, I think that that's relatable to people. It must have been quite different voicing Oscar in the rebuilds compared to the original ADV dubs. You'd have, mm, obviously, yeah. it was about 10 years, I think it would have been almost, um, between mm. the end of the TV series and the start of the rebuild films. So yeah. how, was there a difference to how you approached the character between then and there based on changes in life experience? Or was it something that you just kind of felt you could just easily slip back into? Well, I, I mean, I, I did feel like, you know, Oscar was really easy to uh, sort of like putting on, you know, your, your favorite shirt or something. But the gap isn't sort of in the way that you presented it. So there was the TV series that we worked on in 96 and 97. And then um, we did Death and Rebirth and In the Baby Galleon. We dubbed those in... I believe it was like early 2001 when we dubbed those. And so that was, you know, there was a gap of about four years there, mm -hmm. three or four years, something like that. And then um, a couple of years after that, we did the director's cut footage for the ah. TV series. So that was in like 2004. And then for me, obviously, I'm not in um, the rebuild 1.11. I'm not in that that film, obviously. So I guess then the gap for me was from 2004 to oh, maybe like 2011. Mm. So that was about there was about a seven year gap for me in there. But I still I felt like oh, you know, Oscar's just right here you know yeah. she's just right standing next to me i just i i don't have to really search for her now of course shikinami asuka is not the same as store you asuka they are a little bit different you know mm -hmm. there are some differences in their background and personality well i mean for one thing we don't really know that much about 
Shikinami's background, you know? Mm. Um, for, for example, like it's not really mentioned that much that she's from Germany and she doesn't no. ever speak German. Um, and just, you know, one of the other things about her it, in uh, the TV series that she was obviously so obsessed with, with Mr. Kaji and in the films, Kaji's a very minor character. I mean, he's he is, barely yeah. in the show. Mm. He's barely in that, that the film series at all. And Asuka doesn't seem to really know him or care anything about him or no. anything at all. And then, you know, it's not, not spoilery for the fourth film to say that obviously between the second and third film, there's a, time jump there's 14 yeah. years that have passed so even though oscar appears to be still a 14 year old girl i mean really she's had all these life experiences yeah. and she's she is an adult she's 28 years old even though she doesn't look like it so you know that playing her especially like in that version and then in the new movie where she's an adult Mm. That's, you know, a different version of Oscar as well. Mm. So I did take all that into account. Well, I was going to actually ask about um, the German because when you did that original mm. dub, I imagine seeing, okay, I'm going to have to speak some German for this role must have been quite an interesting experience. Did you have prior language experience before then? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, I could already speak German. So I was <sighs> really, I was really excited about that aspect of the character that just like was coincidentally fantastic for mm -hmm. me from my point of view. And then when we were doing the rebuild movies, and I found out, oh, she doesn't ever speak German anymore, even like, I'm this Um yeah. like, oh, well, that's disappointing. <laughs> so that was oh. that was really one of the most disappointing aspects for me working on the rebuild movies is like oh Oscar doesn't speak German anymore. Going back to redo Oscar's lines for Amazon, what would be the most difficult line to re I guess live through again to you know revoice and you know have to experience those emotions as a character? Well, um, the most difficult thing was the absurd changes that the translator wanted us to do that did not add to the story at all, that um, were awkward and ridiculous things. Mm. Um, like Oscar's signature line is, what are you, stupid? Yeah. And... Right. I mean, that's, this is what Oscar says. I mean, Fred Flintstone says, yabba dabba do. And Oscar says, what are you stupid? Yeah. <laughs> that's what she says for reasons that are completely inexplicable. And just frankly, they are stupid to have her saying, you're an idiot, aren't you? Well, first of all, it's basically synonymous. Second of all, it takes two more syllables to say, and we actually care about matching the mouth flaps. Yeah. They don't, they don't. Um, so it was really that kind of stuff that was very difficult for me personally, because I just feel like, you know, you want to try to fix something that doesn't need to be fixed yeah. in the, in the Ava manga, Oscar says, what are you stupid? Yeah. Because it's canon. Yeah. That's what Oscar has said for 25 years. And so for me, those were the most difficult things. These mm. really stupid, stupid changes that we were required to make. Shinji says, I mustn't run away. Mm. That's what Shinji says, not don't run away. Shinji says, I mustn't run away. Yeah. It's iconic. They are. And Arnold characters. Schwarzenegger doesn't say, guess I'll see you around. He <laughs> says, I'll be back. Okay. <laughs> These are, there are things that certain characters say and they're iconic and just to mess with them for the sake of like, oh, but I want it to be like this way because yeah. I have the power to say that it could be like that. It's like, screw you, dude. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's mm. So there you go. That is my answer for what was the most difficult <laughs> is. Wow. So the dub that we get for Amazon's 3.0 and 2.0 are very different from the versions that were done with Funimation. Yes. Yes. I mean, obviously it's a different cast. I mean, well, some of us are the same and some of us are yeah. not. I mean, I was, I was incredibly excited that we had Amanda Wynn Lee back as Ray mm. because she's just so iconic in that role. Yeah. And 
um, you know, no offense to, to Brina, somebody was going to do the part, but I mean, Amanda is just, she just is Ray. And I was, I was thrilled that she was able to do that. Um, that made me really happy. Now, I was going to say, I'm so, assuming you guys didn't really get to see each other very much in person during recording because of the state of the world, but I imagine it must have been really good to be able to chat and go back and forth with one another to practice um, in the lead up to recording. Oh, we don't do any of that. No. no? None of that happens. <laughs> it's all in your fantasies that that occurs. <laughs> that, that's not a real thing. You're never with any of the other actors, whether there's a pandemic or not a pandemic, you're never with any of the other actors. So the thing that was really different about recording the redub with all of the rebuild movies than in the past is that we were all so spread out in so mm. many different places. Uh, I was recording in a studio in Atlanta. Um, Allison Keith and John Swayze were recording at a studio in, uh, in Houston. Amanda was recording with Dubbing Brothers in Los Angeles, where, where a lot of the other voice actors were recording out there too. I mean, Spike Spencer, he lives in uh, Queensland, so he, he was yeah. recording at a studio in Gold Coast. Um, and uh, Brett Weaver, who plays Toji, he was recording at his home studio in Austin. So people were in all of these different places. And that that's really quite different because that is not usually how that happens. I do want to touch kind of on the rebuild films mm -hmm. and how it does a bit of a difference with the story. And particularly for Oscar, yes. she's a key part of that change. Obviously, she's her character and background has changed a little bit. What was it like seeing the script and seeing some of the changes Oscar went through? And in particular, seeing things like Unit 2's Beast Mode and the character's development in the third and fourth films. Yeah, well, first of all, I loved the beast mode thing. I thought that was really cool. Mm -hmm. All about the beast mode. Loved that. Um, yeah, there was, I mean, we don't really ever see the script in advance. Like, you see it as you're, as you're doing it. So that's when you see the, the script wow. and the scenes and stuff. It's like at the time that you're doing it. Um, but obviously for 3.0, I knew what happened in that because I've recorded the whole movie twice before and I've seen it. So the third movie was so puzzling because there had been this huge time jump and we didn't have any idea of really what had happened in those intervening years. And with the fourth film, I, I wouldn't say that it's much of a spoiler for me to say that it, it picks up pretty soon after the third movie, the fourth yeah. movie does. There is there is not another time jump of another 14 years. Like I say, for me, it was interesting playing her with the idea that she is an adult now. Um, the, of course, the really dark post-apocalyptic landscape of the fourth movie, that gave it a whole different vibe as well, yeah. seeing you know what their day-to-day -day reality is like. It definitely is a very different vibe from the original series and the first two films. Oh, now, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you're still voice acting to this day, obviously. Yes. Um, and you've got plenty of roles under your belt. But other than Oscar, mm -hmm. what have been some of your other favorite roles? Wow. I've had so many, many favorites. Um, one of my favorite shows that I worked on was something called Excel Saga. Oh, yeah. And I loved that. It was a really funny, funny show. And I got I got to play a bunch of different characters in that show. So I, I really loved that. And and as well, uh, a show called Deno Coil, which is not exceptionally well known. It was released in Australia. It was the first place it was actually re released. It was subtitled only like back in 2007, I think. Wow. And then we finally dubbed it in uh, 2016. But I, again, that was another show where I got to play a lot of different characters. Two of the things that I enjoy doing the most is playing um, any kind of critter. And I've played lots of critters, especially a lot of dogs. And also um, any little boy characters. I love that. And so that was both of those shows. I got to play little boys and I got to play critters. So that for me, that's like, I'm all about that. Um, anytime that can happen, um, that's just like a, a lot yeah. of fun for me. I do remember seeing somewhere on, I believe, either your website or on an interview you've done before <laughs> that, um, one of the characters you said most reflected you was in the series Gunsmith Cats. 
Yeah, yeah. I always like that character, Becky, because um, I, I feel like I can relate to Becky. Like, Becky and I are, I think, uh, temperament-wise, personality, I just think probably a lot like Becky. Mm. I'm not as much like a dog or an eight-year-old boy like in real life. And that's probably why I like playing those characters so much because it's something that's really different from who I really am. But, yeah, I that was an answer I gave a long time ago, and I guess I'd still stand by that, that, that I'm a lot like Becky Farah from Gunsmith Cats, which is uh, now available from Red Stuff on, on Blu-ray. Yeah, now, <laughs> I'm sure you've got plenty of anime on that are on your list of favorites, but um, what series do you enjoy that's not so well known? Um, well, one that I just mentioned, Deno Coil, uh, just, it, it's a fantastic show. It's a really beautiful show. It's uh, set in kind of a near future time, and it, it's all about these kids. All of the, the main characters in it are actually children. Uh, most of them are like 12 years old. The adults, there's a couple of adults in there, but they're kind of like props. They're kind of like the adults in uh, the Charlie Brown cartoons, you know. Um, they're not quite wah, 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 but I mean, they're... <laughs> incidental let's say yeah. uh, i love that some of the other shows that, that i really really enjoy doing um wandaba style and um i played sort of a mad scientist um boy genius who's like 12 years old uh dr susumo tsukumo uh, that was super fun to do and also another show where i played a little boy called legend of the mystical ninja and oh. it's based on the goemon video game mm -hmm. and that was super fun i was like this 10 year old boy takasa ishikawa and he plays he loves playing the goemon video game and one day he's playing the game and the characters come out of the tv screen into his bedroom and then he goes on adventures with them it's a really funny show it's just really funny and i i love it so much and then you know there's shows that are like in a much different vein, like Noir, which is a super dark show that I'm in. And that's from about, that's probably about like 18 years ago now, 18, 19 years ago. That's from a while ago. Um, really beautiful um, show with a, with a haunting score. So that's, that's another one. I don't know if that's lesser known or not, but uh, anyway. All really interesting choices. Now, um, mm -hmm. we do have a question from one of our Patreon members. His name's Tojigo. He asked, do you have any memorable recording booth moments from your time during Neon Genesis or any of your other shows? Mm. Yes. Uh, one that particularly stands in my mind from recording um, the TV series of Ava was, I believe it's episode 15, and Shinji and Asuka are hanging out at the apartment by themselves, and they're really bored, and Asuka suggests that they could kiss to kill time. And so there's the kissing scene, and you know, and she holds his nose and everything, mm -hmm. and then she runs off into the bathroom, and she starts, like, gargling with mouthwash in there. <laughs> and I particularly remember doing the gargling scene, which I was just doing with water, and... I got so cracked up that I mean I was laughing and I was trying to do the gargling and then I accidentally inhaled some of the water and so then that took me a long time to regain my composure because I was choking myself and uh, yeah so that was that was a pretty memorable um, moment in the in the booth and then if I can tell another story on myself and this is particularly embarrassing. Um, I would say probably maybe seven, eight years ago, something like that. So in other words, after I've been working in anime for quite a long time, I was, I don't remember what the show was, but a lot of times when we finish doing like the main part of whatever we're in there to do, mm. they'll have us do like a lot of background stuff if there's crowd scenes and stuff like that. So it was some crowd scene where it's a huge auditorium and there's audit, there's an audience and they're watching a performance. And so I would have been doing like the cheers from the audience. Oh, yeah. Yay! Woo! Good job! You know, that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And 
I'm, but I'm watching it as I'm doing it, right? Okay, so all the audience members are cheering, but they're also applauding. And I actually started clapping in the booth, and then the engineer comes on in my ear and says, uh, Tiffany, we don't actually need you to do this class. <laughs> <laughs> Just kind of really got in that moment. Went, yeah, let's clap along. Yeah, I know, I know. It's so embarrassing. I mean, of course, I know I don't have to supply the clapping because it's a sound effect. <laughs> but it's so like, if you talk to other voice actors and they will absolutely tell you, it is, it's like an involuntary response to sort of mimic the body language. I do want to ask you about one of your passions, which is wildlife conservation. I'm assuming you've put a, a bit of your spare time into this as well as, you know, resources to try and help out. Is there any projects you've been involved in? Uh, yeah, actually, um, well, I live in Atlanta now. I've lived here for about three and a half years. But prior to that, when I was in Houston, for nine years, I volunteered with a really terrific organization called the Wildlife Center of Taxes, and they are one of the largest wildlife rehabs in the country. They take in over 11,000 animals a year, and uh, to date, they have treated something like over 380 different species of animals. So they take in all different sorts of animals, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals. They take in everything. Um, even they've treated some arachnids and even insects. So they will take in anything and everything and, uh, you know, give it a fighting chance. And one of the things I did there besides, you know, obviously the animal care and feeding baby animals, because most of the animals that we get in were um, orphans. Mm -hmm. But I also did uh, wildlife education. So I went to... Um, different functions. I did presentations in elementary schools and at different fairs and festivals and, and things like that. And uh, yes, that was, it was a very meaningful part of my life. And now that I'm living in a, a different city, a different part of the country, I'm still very mindful about the wildlife in my area. Mm. And, uh, you know, if I see a, a turtle that's out in the road, I'll go pick it up and relocate it so it doesn't get hit by a car. Yeah. To kind of wrap up, I figured I'd ask you, and I think I know what it's <laughs> going to be, what your favorite quote is from Oscar and if you'd be happy to say it. Huh? I have a couple, but of course the, the always go to is, what are you, stupid? <laughs> uh, but other than that, other than her famous tagline, really my favorite bit of Asuka, and I believe this is from episode nine, is, uh, hey, why the gloomy face? I'm the most popular girl in school. You should appreciate your good fortune. Oh, wow. Such a classic line. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. It just, it sums up Asuka so well. It really does. Look, well, Tiffany, yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. We'll look forward to seeing what your next big project will be. Um, apparently, Anno is still thinking of explaining what happened in that 14-year gap in between the films. So whether we get a series yeah. of some form or just a series of novels, I guess we'll see. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> a massive thank you to Tiffany Grant for joining us. She's had some fantastic roles over the years, and I'm sure there's plenty more coming as well. If you're interested in checking out the Evangelion films, they are on Amazon Prime worldwide with a brand new dub featuring the original cast of Shinji, Rei, Oscar, and Masato. There's also a brand new Blu-ray collection of the original 1995 series in the works, so check with your local anime suppliers for details. At this stage, it sounds like it's including both the ADV and Netflix dub. All the shows mentioned in this video can be found in the description below. Please be aware that not all of them are available to stream in every region. If you've enjoyed what you've seen, give us a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. We've got plenty more great stuff lined up, including a look at the upcoming rom-com series Komi-san Can't Communicate for next season. If you'd like to join the Kawaii Fire community, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter and Discord, where we share the latest anime news, memes and events. 
We also have a fortnightly anime podcast called Kawaii Radio, featuring a selection of the latest and classic anime, reviews, interviews, and deep dives on genres and studios. Follow the links in the video description to find us in your podcasting app of choice. A big thank you to our Patreon members who are supporting the channel. If you'd like to support us and get access to some behind the scenes content like outtakes, extra podcast episodes, and so on, you can find the link for the Patreon below. And with that, I'm Kyle, and until next time, watch some anime.